So I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about my adventures uh, trying to link uh, literature to the data in the life sciences. And I have the privilege of working at an organization, uh, EMBL EBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, that has a lot of data and uh, is a, has a growing program uh, in hosting literature data as well. So I'm going to uh, divide the talk into four um, portions. The first of all, I'll define the literature that I'm talking about and the data that I'm talking about. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we actually make connections between those uh, articles and the data in the public databases we have at the EBI. And then I'm going to show you a case study of what, can, what, what you can do um, when, when you do that, linking exercise, and then uh, some of the future directions and challenges that I think uh, we have as a community. And uh, I think the life sciences uh, is, a, you know, is, is, is similar to other disciplines in that sense. <coughs> Okay, so the EBI has a number of databases. Uh, where's the, the, looking for a, no, never mind. For a red spot, but I can't see where to do it. Um, the EBI has a number of databases, what I call big data. Uh, these are deposition databases. That means that when scientists publish articles, uh, they, they, de they co-deposit, if you like, data sets that they produce as they do their science, and in particular, uh, I'm talking about nucleotide data, DNA sequences, um, proteins. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> He's right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I'm calling these the sort of primary databases, if you like. And then we've got other databases, also big data, which are sort of curated, and these, these databases uh, don't have uh, uh, good. Which, where is Bridget? Um, <laughs> these uh, these data aren't aren't deposition databases, but they're curated. And an example of this is Uniprot, um, whereby about 50 curators actually spend their time pulling together information about proteins. So each record in the database is a sort of conceptual representation of a protein, and can, and has a basically is a list of links, enriched links that point to other data resources that describe that protein and its biology. Uh, I come at this whole uh, data perspective from the, uh, from the perspective of research articles. I used to be a, uh, a journal editor, and then I went to the NCBI and built uh, full text databases there. And uh, my key interest is linking to the big databases at the bottom. But more recently, as we all know, we have these uh, unstructured data sets uh, that uh, are emerging that don't really fit in the kind of databases that we have at the EBI. Uh, just to say, the big data um, that I'm describing is, is frequently supported by funder mandates. Uh, there's long associations with journals to, that require deposition in the databases. Uh, there's metadata that describes them, international standards uh, that, that uh, keep track of, uh, of the formats that we use. And many of these databases are built in, colla in sort of global collaborations, uh, particularly with the US and Japan and other European organizations such as the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics. Um, so we have a history of working with journals in the life sciences. This is um, an article from 1988 which describes a journal called Nucleic Acids Research. New, <laughs> new policy to um, require an accession number for a database if someone um, creates a sequence as part of their research and describes it in the paper. So up to about this point, as DNA sequencing technology was emerging, people used to actually type out DNA sequences in the paper and then publish the paper. Uh, and it was realized by some forward-thinking people that this was not going to work in the long term. And EMBL Data Bank was born. And then with this collaboration with uh, NAR, uh, the editors of NAR insisted that if there was a sequence, then they had to submit it to this new data bank. They get an accession number back, a persistent identifier. We call them accession numbers. And then they cite that accession number in the article. So gone now are the long sequences in articles, thank goodness, because some of them would reach the height of the... Uh, um, Washington Mon Monument. Uh, D the DNA for the human genome would, if you put it on a telephone directory, would reach the height of the Washington Monument. So, uh, obviously, that makes no sense at all. Uh, and this this model of uh, submitting to the sequence database is get, getting back a persistent identifier, and then citing the identifier in the article has been extended to several other biological data types since the late 80s. So, what do we? What have we? What data am I talking about here? I'm talking about. Um, 
the kind of data we have in these public thematic databases. This is all public. Uh, we make it as widely as available as possible by FTP, uh, by web services, by websites. Um, and at the top, we've got the nucleotide data. This is the fastest growing data and the, and the hungriest uh, for disk storage. It's actually becoming a management problem. Uh, the rate of producing this data is, uh, is actually outstripping uh, the disk capacity to keep up with it right now. Um, but then there's in, uh, protein type data, which is Uniprot, which I mentioned has about 1.2 million entries, I think, and Interpro, which is a protein families database. So proteins that do similar things exist in little families across evolution. Array Express, this is data that um, where people have done experiments to um, define gene expression, sometimes in disease conditions, for example, comparing mice with diabetes, mice he with healthy mice to see which, which different genes are switched on or off in the disease condition. And PDBE is a protein structure database. This is the 3D structure of proteins that allows them to do their biological functions. So, for example, uh, enzymatic binding pockets and so on, where the enzymes go in and uh, do their substrates go in and they do their, their work. So there's two petabytes of data at the EBI at the moment, and this scales to a requirement for seven petabytes of raw disk space for all the compute and the backup and so on. And as I mentioned, the, the big, the hungry one here is the DNA. And we have a commitment, a long-term commitment. Our institute is a long-term storage archive for these data. So to the literature side of things, um, the two databases that I run are um, Site Explore and UK PubMed Central. Site Explorer is a database of abstracts, i.e. metadata. It contains 26 million abstracts, um, largely PubMed, which is about 22 or 3 million of that um, total. But patents from the European Patent Office, that's about 4 million. And then the other substantial contributor are abstracts from Agricola, which is a, an agricultural database from the USDA in the USA. And uh, there's a significant overlap between Agricola and PubMed, and we, we take the Agricola records when we don't have them in PubMed. So PubMed are our sort of primary database, if you like. And there's about half a million Agricola records. Uh, we have a website, so you can use it interactively. We have web services. And we've added value to this by um, calculating a citation network, which I'll give you a demonstration of in a little while. Because uh, we're lucky to be at the uh, EBI, we can uh, quite easily make links uh, to the databases that are also at the EBI. And um, we also text mine the full text articles and uh, the abstracts. Um, so there's about, this database grows at about 1.1 million new records a year. UK PubMed Central is a more recent addition. Uh, this is a full text database. So we have, this, this is not just abstracts, this is um, the full text, either as scanned content, OCR content for the older stuff, um, some PDFs, and the, the majority of the newer stuff is all in XML according to the NLMDTD, which is public, again. A lot of newer publishers just use the NLMDTD now rather than creating their own. Uh, there's a website. We're soon to release a web service on this, which I hope that people will use. And I can give you details of that in about two weeks, I hope. In fact, next week it's deliverable for the Wednesday, so we'll see. It's very soon. Uh, the UK PubMed Central website and web service is supplemented by all the abstracts in Site Explore. So when you use the UK PubMed Central website, you can search all the abstracts and all the full text. And all the full text articles are represented as abstracts. So this is sort of it's essentially we have a database of abstracts for which we, are, we have some in the full text, basically. And that grows at a slower rate, but it's about 150,000 articles a year. A little bit more about UK PMC. It's built in collaboration with uh, PubMed Central in the United States, developed at the National Library of Medicine. And there's another node in Canada. Um, the European Bioinformatics Institute is now leading the project, and we do this uh, in, in collaboration with the British Library and the University of Manchester. And it's supported by 18 funders that have mandates that say, if you are funded by us, you must deposit your articles in UK PubMed Central. Um, and their total spend of those funders uh, is 2 billion GBP. Um, they're led by the Wellcome Trust, has all the major life science funders in the UK, BBSRC, MRC, Cancer Research UK, and so on. The European Fund is a Telethon Italy and uh, Austrian uh, Science Foundation. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a life science uh, repository, uh, has a manuscript submission service, i.e. has self-archiving self route for grant holders. Uh, as a database of grant information, we have details of about 18,000 PIs. 
that's the grant holders, uh, as a grant reporting and funder analysis tool. So the, fu the, the, the PIs can come into the database and claim articles that are theirs and link them <coughs> to the funding that they got for that article. And, the, and likewise, the funders can come in and say, how many articles uh, have we funded? Uh, which are the most highly cited articles that we've funded in this database? Things like this. Uh, we have, the, in terms of usage, there's, um, we're up to about um, 8 million requests a month um, from about, and there's about 40,000 um, IPs every day. So how are we doing on the open access stakes? Well, uh, I was quite surprised to learn, actually, I just haven't looked at this figure for a while at the bottom, that now 20% of the articles in, a, in UKPMC are open access. Um, a few years ago, this wasn't the case. It was only about 10%, and it really shows uh, that open access is increasing in the, in the life science research space. Um, we get these open access articles, um, for the most part, via the usual publication routes that scientists use. So, for example, if a scientist publishes an article in PLOS Biology, uh, part of the deal with that publisher is that that article, because it's open access, goes straight into PMC. And from PMC, it gets circulated to all the nodes, UK PMC and PMC Canada. So uh, that's, that's why we've got uh, so many OA articles, uh, for the most part. Only about 15% of the OA articles come through, uh, actually 50% of the articles come through um, the, the um, self-archiving route. So 85% come by publishers. And it's actually, if you look at a publication year on year, in 2010, I think it's about 40% of the articles that have a publication date of 2010 are open access. So there's still a long way to go, but uh, things are improving slowly. So how do we make the connections between all this data? Well, two main ways. Firstly, links. Uh, when people submit sequences to the sequence databases, there's metadata associated with that sequence, and one element of the metadata is usually a publication describing that data they've just submitted. So what we can do is we can turn those links around and from the literature link back to the database. And we can do this for several database types. Um, so that's why I call it, um, it's links by the author, author made links. But also, in cases uh, like Uniprot, uh, where the database has got an, a lot of curation on top of it, a lot of the job of the curators is to look through the literature on quite a detailed level. You're looking at figure legends and things like this to, uh, to link that Uniprot record to the literature. Um, so we also reverse those links. And this is expensive, of course, because it requires people to do it. And it's quite slow. Uh, the, I know the Uniprot um, curators look at m many, many, many more articles than they actually add to the database. They're only adding two or three articles a, a week, I think, per, per curator. But they're looking at 50 a pop. Uh, but it's very high quality. You know they're going to be good and relevant and true. Text mining, we also do. This is obviously by algorithms and uh, based on uh, you know, dictionaries or um, terminologies uh, that you, you basically look in the full text for those terms. Um, so the good news about this is that uh, it's, it's, very, it's very fast and you can get through millions of articles. The bad news is that the quality is variable depends on how good the algorithm is and how up-to-date the dictionary is and so on. And you can get quite a lot of false positives sometimes, which annoy scientists no end. Uh, the other good news is that it, because it's post-publication, you can sometimes, you, you allow a layer of computation uh, that might be able to find new associations that the individual authors, when they're writing their paper, uh, weren't thinking about. In terms of the links we make, uh, Here's a list of the data types we link to. Proteins, nucleotides, OMIM, which is an online Mendelian inheritance in man, which is a very nice text-based database on um, genetic diseases. Uh, chemicals, protein structures, clinical reviews, protein families and protein-protein interactions, and the list goes on. We're adding them. Uh, we're soon to add gene expression experiments. The winner, in terms of the number of articles linked, is Uniprot, because of all those curators working all that time. There's 100... 800,000 articles in our space that have been linked to Uniprot. And the numbers go down to things like protein-protein interactions, where they're very, uh, uh, you know, they need a lot of um, scientific work to, in order to define a protein-protein interaction unequivocally. So there's not many papers there. I think there's about 5,000 papers in that column. In terms of the text mining, um, we mine currently six semantic types, genes and protein names, gene ontology terms. This is a, 
uh, uh, an ontology to describe um, cellular and molecular biology. Organisms or species, uh, diseases, accession numbers or persistent identifiers, um, and chemicals, again from an ontology called Kebi. And as you can see, the profiles, is the, the, the bottom line is the number is quite big. Uh, on the far right, there's the total number of annotations. So there's 15 million gene proteins annotated across the whole data set. Uh, but actually that covers only a quarter of a million unique terms. Unique terms is the number of terms in the dictionary that you're using. And in terms of the number of articles touched, uh, well, there's 2.2 million articles in the data set, and overall, some of these are touching 1.8 million articles. So you can see it applies to quite nicely across the whole data set. Although, not without challenges, as you can see at the bottom, the chemicals here, the, the dictionary size is quite small, only 76,000 terms, but the number of articles annotated is enormous, and the number of annotations is the winner, 22 million. Uh, and that's because this is we run into these... Um, difficulties where you're crossing domains, where whereas the gene protein dictionary is very relevant for biology, the chemical dictionary is slightly off. I and mean, obviously there's a lot of uh, commonality between chemistry and biology, but in the world of chemistry, the term RNA or DNA is quite, a, ooh, is quite an interesting novel term because they're talking mostly about small molecules, but in biology, uh, DNA is a rubbish term, pretty much. So. Um, a lot of these large numbers of annotations will be for things like DNA and RNA. Um, and, and I know that open air is um, very interested in cross-disciplinary integration, and this is one of the, one of the areas of uh, interesting areas of research. So here's a case study from biology about how we then use those links, or how researchers might use those links when they're trying to do their science. How many biologists do we have in the audience? By training, might be no matter how long ago. <laughs> Thirty years ago. Thirty years ago. Oh well, we were, we were teaching evolution then, I think. Um, <laughs> there are some basic truths in biology that help link us all together, and one of them is uh, that in evolution, we all um, derive from a common ancestor, from the primeval slime, 3.9 billion years ago, and since then. We have diverged depending on uh, where we live and how we live. And um, basically the eukaryotes, of which we are one, in animals over there on the right, are related to bacteria, aquiflex, down the bottom left, but only very distantly. Uh, and of course, um, we're far more closely related to things like chimpanzees and mice and rats. So um, the more... <laughs> Basically, the more similar we are as organisms, the more similar our DNA is. However, because we are all related on some level, there are, there are some elements of DNA that are the same across all spheres of life. And um, on this basis, we can do a lot of computation with our DNA in our databases to see where the similarities are between DNA from different organisms. So I'm going to tell you quite an old story that, that illustrates the value of... Um, not only keeping the data archived, but keeping it archived in a way that it can be computed on, i.e. it can be reused by others coming after you doing your own experiment. So this is a, quite a long time ago now. There were some researchers in the United States who were looking at um, human colon cancer, and they, um, they discovered a gene that was implicated in human colon cancer, and they sequenced it. And uh, this is represented by this line query at the top, and it's repeated three times. Um, and what they did is that they took this sequence and they, they submitted it to the sequence database using an algorithm called, algorithm called BLAST, which is a sequence similarity algorithm, which basically said, are there any sequences in the database that are similar to mine? And lo and behold, there was a sequence that was similar that came up in the database. Uh, that's the subject, which is the second, fourth, and sixth line. And what BLAST does, it aligns these sequences so that you can see the areas of similarity. And here, the similarity is indicated by a repeated letter in the middle line. So you can see they're not identical, but there is a lot of similarity between the two sequences. So when those, when those they got very excited about this, because this is an E. coli gene. So the E. coli is very distantly related to humans, but on some level is related. And when they looked at that record for the E. coli gene, uh, in the metadata there, there was a paper associated with that gene. So they clicked on the link to the paper, and lo and behold, that paper describes the role of that gene in DNA repair. So immediately, by doing not very much work, um, 
and actually leveraging the work of others that has gone before, they found out that the gene that they'd isolated associated with human colon cancer likely had a mechanism that involved DNA repair, i.e. When, it, when it's mutated and it goes wrong, the DNA is not repaired properly, so cancer ensues. The, 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 all the cell processes and cell division goes wrong, basically. So that was their hypothesis. And that was allowable from the... Uh, of course, they had to go back and prove this with experiments. They couldn't just uh, believe that, but uh, this was a very strong indicator and gave them real pointers to do more experiments. Now, this paper was published a while ago, 1993, in Cell. Um, um, and here it is in uh, UK PubMed Central. And I don't know if this is an enhanced publication or not. I'm not sure. But um, here's the abstract. Uh, there's a text mining been applied to the abstract here. So we've got our gene ontology has picked out the terms mismatch repair and chromosome diseases, has picked out hereditary non polypopsis co colon cancer, polyposis colon cancer, uh, genes and proteins, MUTES, and MSH2, that's the names of the genes, the human and E. coli genes, and so on. We've got some funding information at the bottom. This is all funded by the NIH, and various institutes at the NIH. And at the top, we've got the value-added stuff that UK PMC has done in the tabs. We've got citation tabs. This shows you the number of articles and the articles citing this paper. Bioentity shows you the terms that we've mined from the full text, if they're available, and the databases we've linked to. And related articles is a, a natural language processing algorithm that matches uh, abstracts that are similar. That's a service from uh, PubMed. So the, uh, the, uh, the PubMed ID of this, the, the identifier of this article is at the top, 8252616, uh, with some magic uh, syntax that is secret, which we hope to make less secret uh, in the future, um, you can, you can uh, say how, how many articles cite this one using that identifier. Um, what makes it unique in our space is the suffix med. Um, and here they are. There's actually 849 um, articles have cited this one in our information space. And actually two of them here, this uh, little um, multicolored flag, signifies that we've got that article in full text available. One's in PLOS One and one's in the Journal of Gynecological Oncology. So all these papers have cited this one uh, since 93. So it's, that's quite highly cited, actually. 800 and so is uh, pretty, pretty good. Most papers get cited less than 50 times. Actually, half of PubMed's only been cited zero times. So it's, it's a famous paper. Actually, I should say, if you use UKPMC, there's a time cited sort order there now. So you can, if you're looking at any list of, of any interest, you can sort by time cited. And actually, this is what um, Mark Walpole at the Wellcome Trust did when we implemented that. The first thing he did was look for paper, articles funded by the Wellcome Trust and then sort them by a time cited, see which was the best, so to speak. So one of these papers that, uh, that has cited the original one um, actually went on to elucidate the structure of that E. coli gene. This is the protein structure here, and it's a very pretty picture showing the topology of all the domains of the protein. And you can see the bit, you can see there's a DNA helix in little dots around there. And so this is showing where the protein binds the DNA helix, presumably to do its job in DNA repair. Um, so, oh, I'd like, like to read more about that. So in, in this database, again, the metadata links to the literature, that, uh, just the paper that describes this structure. Unfortunately, it was done a few, a few years ago, uh, and it's at nature.com. I can't read it because I'm not at an institute that subscribes to nature or I'm at, or I'm at home. Um, I suspect, actually, if this paper was published now, it would be available because it's, it's funded by the NIH and they have a mandate also that papers should be open access and, or available, at least in UK PM, uh, in PMC. Right, so I'm stuck. So what do I do? Well, um, I, look, uh, I look up this... Uh, structure in the protein database. And again, because like the BLAST algorithm for DNA, there's an also an algorithm that will find you similar structures because the, the data is kept in a similar format that it can be computed on. And I look down this list and I find a protein structure here. Here's the identifier of it, 1EWQ. I don't expect you to read that. Uh, these are similar ones. If I look at this, I then use this um, term to search UKPMC because we've text mined the content. Um, Here's a list of articles that contain this term, 1EWQ. Uh, and that's a reasonably uh, uh, clean search there. So here are some articles uh, that describe that similar structure. But these are all available in PubMed Central, so you can read the paper. 
One of these papers has some beautiful figures. I don't really understand what they mean, but I think what they're doing is now this research has moved on in time from identification of the, of the gene to protein structure to then finding out how that protein structure actually does its job. And this is single molecule analysis of the dynamics of that DNA um, protein interaction. So things really have moved on in the last uh, 20 years. And as you can see, uh, surrounding this figure, this beautiful figure, there's, for which you cannot click and get the data, by the way, it's just a beautiful figure, um, there are two supplementally, supplemental data files described. And these are linked to the article, but only in a kind of narrative kind of way. So this is the modern article, if you like. So challenges in future directions. One thing we have to... Um, we have to accept and learn from the physicists on perhaps is that uh, is data-driven science with huge projects that produce um, core resources where the resource is really not the paper but the data in the database. And this is one on cancer genomes. And I don't know how many authors there are there, but uh, I don't really know what they've all, all done in the contribution to that paper. And I certainly know that actually these kind of huge author lists really do distort uh, citation counts and, and things like H-index measures. Um, but really, the, the key of this paper is, and this is a landmark paper, it's not really describing any biology, and the reuse is post-publication by other people. Um, and really, the amount of data being produced now is prompting places like the EBI and other people to make quite hard decisions about what we do about keeping complete data sets, and should we do it, and should we uh, invoke that cost, or is there an editorial process that we need to apply for long-term uh, archiving? So here's that slide from before, and I haven't really talked about unstructured data at all. <laughs> um, I think for, there's future possibilities for unstructured data, and one is clear, although the research article links to the, um, links to the paper, it does so in a narrative kind of way, it doesn't do it in a structured way, and this, the data, those data objects themselves don't link back to the paper, they're just sort of free-floating files in a repository. Um, and the question is, uh, how could we structure those links better? Should we structure them better? Uh, and furthermore, are there any ways that we can reuse this unstructured data? I mean, potentially, we could have curated uh, data sets uh, if we see similarities, or even, you know, maybe they would be used as a seed point to start new um, thematic databases. Maybe if there's a new data type that's coming through, that we can see a requirement for that uh, more easily if, if we know what data there is in that unstructured data. I'm aware. I've got one more slide. <laughs> I was interrupted by all the, uh, all the people coming online. Um, so I think one thing we must do is analyse what's in this unstructured data that we have associated with articles right now. Uh, there's about 200,000 articles. Um, it's about 10% overall of the articles in the UK PMC have unstructured data associated with them. It's about one in three articles now submitted with data um, attached to it. And that's what it looks like. It's a big old mess, is the bottom line. With PDFs accentuated largely because publishers, I think, uh, use PDFs. Uh, but what's actually in those files is, is unclear. I don't think they're all beautiful data sets, put it that way. I think there's a lot of rubbish in them as well that just didn't fit in the article for some reason. Uh, finally, I think uh, the, uh, Oya made a really important point that usability is really, really important. And I think uh, one of the key things we must do, whatever it is, is to uh, make sure that we uh, apply uh, the solutions in the context of the science that people do. So here is that um, E. coli gene. Uh, here's the gene information. Here it is on the genome. Um, and down the, down the um, side here, you've got information on gene expression, on proteins, on protein structure, and on the literature. And this is a sort of thin slice across the top of the data that's available, and you can dig deeper than that um, if you wish. That's it. I'll just leave you that URL if you want to go and have a look. And it's just faded away for some reason. <laughs> okay, that's, that's it.